handle the word that you've given us in the proper way. Help me that your bride would be edified. That through these words, they would they would go down for her good and for your glory. I just ask that you help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Song of Solomon. <clears throat> now, uh, our primary passages are going to be from chapters 4 through chapter 6, and we're going to be kind of picking some, some of the key points of the conversation of the song out, so we're not going to be exegeting all of the three chapters, um, but we're going to be looking at a good portion of all of them. However, before we get into the text, um, the thing with the Song of Solomon is it's, it's a book of scriptures that's commonly, I would say it's commonly misinterpreted or at least in our contemporary context, if it's interpreted properly, it's interpreted in a way that can at least be said, uh, it results in a shallow application. Uh, and so many times Christians are left wondering what to do with this book after reading it. And, and young Christians are warned, don't touch that. Don't, don't read the Song of Solomon. Don't touch that piece of scripture until you get to a certain point because it's not for you. As though reading the song will send them into a fit of rebellion and as though not all scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. And so many Christians think this song is full of strong themes of sexuality and marriage, and, and thus they reserve it only for the married, or those who are getting ready to be married, or, or shortly after. And they reserve it for that group, lest one who's unprepared twists the scriptures and fall into a fit of temptation. That's the mind. And while those who hold to this heavy form of literalism in their interpretation, they are partially correct in the thematic elements, they miss the key point of the book. And thus, this application leaves Christians weak and wanting when they come to the book of the Song of Solomon. If you look at the Song of Solomon only for what it says about your marriage, you're missing the point, And you have successfully put your cart, pull your horse. This morning, I want to reorient your scope of interpretation to that historical way which our fathers held, which is to say... The, the theme of marriage and the theme of intense and deep intimate relationship is present, but it is peripheral to the book. And these themes, uh, they're incomplete without meditating on the main point of the song, which is to reveal the abiding steadfast love of God for his covenant people. And more specifically, it is Christ's deep and patient, enduring and intimate love for Jesus or Jesus' love for the bride, the church, and every member therein. So with that, last week, we received the blessing of a sharp-edged and poignant sermon titled, You Are Not Far From the Queen. And in that sermon, we were given an exhortation to examine ourselves against the scriptures and see if we ourselves are not far from the kingdom, or if we are indeed seated at the feet of and now my desire this week is, after shifting your interpretive lens with this book, is to follow that sermon directly and lift up with a tender hand the soul of that brother or sister who after this week of self-examination sees clearly the stains of sin in his life or her life and how utterly unworthy those sins and those stains make him in front of the holy, holy, holy Lord of glory. So I call you again, as I called you before, to look to the Son and thrust yourself in faith upon his great mercy this morning. Now, before we finally come to our, our key text this morning, so there are some introductory matters that we need to, to tackle. The Song of Solomon is essentially the dramatic unfolding of a love affair of a common young woman and the king that she desires. We read in the voice of three characters. We read in the voice of the bride, the groom, and then it's interrupted with the voice of the chorus who represent various people, normally the daughters of Jerusalem, this, this audience that is witnessing this drama unfold. And throughout the book, we see this kind of dramatic conversation of the bride with her groom, sporadically interjected with that audience and the observers. But this poem, though it's titled The Song of Solomon, it is ultimately the bride's song. It is ultimately through the voice of the bride, through the mind and the, the perspective of the bride that we read this book. She is the only one whose internal thoughts we are able to see as well as her voice when she calls out to the one she loves. 
And so the whole song is from her perspective. So to get the most out of the song, then we must understand these characters of the bride and the groom. So some key passages here, uh, just some introductory or some, some, some things that kind of show us a little bit about the bride first. Uh, she, the bride, she loves and she passionately desires the love of the groom. And we can see that in chapter one, uh, verses two through four. It says, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. She says, draw me after you and let us run together. And in verse 7 of that chapter, tell me, O you whom my soul loves, where do you pasture your flock? Where do you make it lie down at noon? Or why should I be like one who veils herself out beside the flock of your companion? And all the way over in chapter 3, we see her love and her desperate love for the king when she says, on my bed, night after night, I saw him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but did not find him. I must arise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I must seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but did not find him. She also describes herself as, as beautiful, yes, but commonly undesirable. In, in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, she says, I am black but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, the curtains of Solomon. She says, do not stare at me because I'm swarthy, for the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me a caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. She has been put out to work in the field. She hasn't been uh, sheltered away. She hasn't been pampered. She hasn't, she, she's not like one of these desirable women of Jerusalem who, who have been protected all their life. She has been thrown out to work. She's been scorched by the sun. She is... Beautiful, yes, but commonly undesirable in her own eyes. And her family declares her as such all the way at the end of the book in chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. Her brothers say, we have a little sister and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? They're saying she's a child. She's not a woman. Is she a wall? We'll build on her a battlement of silver. But if she's a door, then we'll barricade her with planks of cedar. And so they're trying to protect her or shield her from the one who desires her. She's kept a garden in the hope of presenting it to her beloved. As she, as she says in chapter 1, verse 6, she says, They made me a caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. More on the garden later. And finally, the groom. He is regal and powerful. In chapter 3, he's called Solomon. Chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. What is this coming up from the wilderness? Like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all scented powers of the merchant. Behold, it's the traveling couch of Solomon, 60 mighty men around it, on the mighty men of, it, of the mighty men of Israel. The king, the groom, he's desired by all. Chapter 1, verse 3, she says, your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. But when he speaks to the bride, he declares the bride is beautiful. and He makes her so. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, to me, my darling you are like my mare among the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of beads. And then the chorus comes in and says, we will make for you ornaments of gold with beads of silver. He's a king and a shepherd. Chapter 1, verse 7. Tell me, O you whom my soul loves, where do you pasture your flocks? Chapter 2, verse 16. My beloved is mine and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. And of course, all of these things can be shown to be images and pictures of the most beautiful covenant relationship of marriage. The headship of the husband, that's present. His role in sanctifying his bride, you see that throughout the book. The purifying and elevating of the bride in marriage. The deep love that they have for one another. But I say, again, all of that is peripheral. It's secondary. It's most important, and you get it in its, in its deepest depth when you apply it secondarily, when you apply it after seeing the main point. And this is why we began reading in Ephesians 5, because while the mysteries of marital love in this song are great, it is speaking with reverence to Christ in the church. So chapter 4, four verse 7, is where we'll begin our main uh, tackling of the, of the scriptures here. Chapter 4, verse 7. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you, says the king. 
on the wedding day of the king and his beloved, which began back in chapter 3 and culminates here, we see the king expressing his adoration for his beloved. In this single sentence, do we see the great love the king has for his bride. He says, you are altogether beautiful, and there is no blemish in you. Now you can imagine, she may be thinking, she may be saying to herself, how can he love me like this? How can he, the king, love me like this? How can this king delight in me? He must mean another. He must be talking to someone else. She's scorched, she's blistered from the sun and and all of her hard labors like we read in chapter 1. But still, the king says, you are altogether beautiful. And what's more, there is no blemish in you. So, does the Lord Jesus tell you this, saint? The Son of God delights in you. He says, you are altogether beautiful to him. You are darling to him. Now, perhaps after this last week, if you were honest with yourself and you took time to truly examine your life and truly examine your actions and the the delights and the affections of your heart, perhaps you saw the filth that has clung to you in your sin. Perhaps you were pierced to your heart and brought to your knees in tears thinking, maybe I am only near the kingdom. Perhaps I've tasted the delight of Christ, but I've only been deceiving myself, thinking that I am his. Maybe you spent this week crying out to the Savior in repentance, asking for forgiveness for the shallow heart toward him. Christian, look to what he says. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. And there is no blemish in you. And he is telling the truth because Christ cannot lie. But he can't mean me, you might think. right? He can't be talking about me. I've seen my sin. I know how wicked my heart is. Listen, saints, listen to the Savior in his love. He says, there is no blemish in you. Friend, has he not made you this way by his blood? Have you not been washed? Do you doubt him? Do you doubt that he can wash you still? I've heard it said, and it seems very true in my experience, that as a saint grows nearer to Christ, as he comes to know Christ more, he sees his righteousness, he sees his holiness. As he grows closer to Christ, he sees that holiness more clearly, and he sees himself in comparison, and it amplifies the filthiness of the rebellion that he sees, because he sees the purity of Christ. And the more he sees himself, the more he sees how far away he is from that perfect standard of righteousness. And this experience makes Christian men and women a prime target for attack from the enemy, to doubt their standing in Christ, which is really to doubt the ability of the Savior himself. The accusation goes, look at you and all of your filth, and look at him. Look at how much time you've spent thinking you're a Christian, and you still walk in this sin. You don't love him. You don't belong to him. You're deceived. You just think you're a Christian. And all this time, you don't even know what that means. He won't save you. He doesn't want you. Faith, look at what your faith has gotten. you. You don't actually believe any of this. And all of those accusations lead one to a pit of despair where he strives, he strives in himself to please Jesus, hoping that he could maybe earn Christ's favor one more time. All because he doubts the ability for Christ to save such a sinner as himself. And perhaps you're like one of these. Perhaps you're like this one who even, perhaps even now describing this internal struggle Your thoughts go to yourself and and they accuse you and they condemn you, saying, oh, you of little faith. Friends, silence the voice of the accuser. And look again to your Savior. He says, you are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Rest and rejoice in the words of your king that you, lowly Christian, are altogether beautiful to him. Once you were dead in your trespasses and sins. By the eternal loving kindness of your master and savior, now you are made new. Therefore, if anyone, in, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. The new things have come, 2 Corinthians 5. Now, let's keep going into verse 8. Come away with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon, journey down from the summit of Amana, from the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. Come away with me. Church, observe this call to come away. 
the groom calls out to the bride and he calls her to come to him, to be near him, to come away with him and be alone with him. He calls her to intimately commune with him. But where does he call her from? He calls her from Lebanon, from the summits of Amana and Sinir and Hermon. And all of these together, they're a mountain range near Lebanon. He's calling her out of Lebanon. He calls her to come to him from Lebanon, this place characteristic of great comfort and wealth and abundance that we see in the Old Testament. Lebanon, this is the place where the cedars that filled the temple were grown. This is where they were exported from. And he calls her to come down from there. He's bidding her and inviting her to come to him. But he's commanding her to forsake all of her previous dwellings and comforts. He's saying she must part with these great heights and come to be with him. And it is not as though he's giving her some kind of contingent ultimatum saying, if you want to receive my love, then you must come to me. No, it's an announcement and a command from the overflow of his love saying, where they will seek to devour you. He says, come down from there, my love. Brothers and sisters, do you smell the aroma of your Savior in these verses? Does he not call you out in love saying, come away with me to a secret place? Does he not bid you to come and be alone with him? Does he not say, come and delight in me? Does he not call you away from that old life to forsake those old ways to be his? To forsake the old wicked delights of the things that you used to love that tie up your soul for destruction? In the scriptures we read, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Matthew chapter 10, 37 and 38. Oh, what sweet delight it is to be bid to come near the Lord. To be bid, come and die with him. For, it's, for is that not true living? For he who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 10, 30. He is calling you to come away, friend. He is calling you. He's commanding you to come down from the heights. Do you not hear him? Are you his bride? Then come away with him. Leave these old mountains, leave these old hills, these old idols of family and security, comfort and materialism. To the wind with the cedars of Lebanon, if it means that I can't have Jesus. For there are lions among these trees, and there are leopards in these mountains, and they want to devour your soul. And if it means I die, then I don't care. Just let me come away with you, Lord. Let me be near you. Come away with him, brothers and sisters. Verse 9. You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. The king says this to his bride on his wedding day. He says, you have made my heart beat faster. Think of that. This common woman put to work in the field, who's, who's pining after her king day after day as she sees him tending his flocks, who's just fantasizing that she might catch his eye. He has made, she has made his heart beat faster with a single glance of her eyes. His love for her is so deep, his desire is so strong, that it only takes a glance for him to be moved by her. Brothers and sisters, look at these verses and rejoice. For that is the Lord Jesus, and that is how he speaks to the body of his bride. Jesus is your king, yes. And as your king, you must reverence him. You must fear him. You must. But he's also your groom. He's your husband, and he loves you. Every time you fall to your knees and lift up your eyes toward heaven, his heart beats faster. He looks down on you, this sinner come near to the king in humble faith, not with disdain, not with pity, but with joy and desire and a passionate love. What honor to pray to your king. And what joy fills his soul, your soul, to hear his voice, to hear for him, to hear your voice before him. You have made my heart beat faster with a single strand of your necklace. He says, and who gave her this necklace? Who gave this woman the necklace that he so delights in? Did he not? 
Was it not the king's gift to his beloved? You, saint, you are the prize of your king. Not because you're just so great in yourself. Not because you're so perfect in and of yourself. Not because you have some hidden value you have to discover in yourself. To the wind with that shallow new age garbage. It's meaningless. You are his beloved prize because he has made you so. He has plunged into the depths of the ocean of death and plucked you out from the muck and made you more valuable than the finest pearls and gems. He has done that. Your king has clothed you in the finest linen. And out, it's from the out of the overflow of his love for you. So know that his love is contingent not on your beauty, but on his, the exceeding grace he, which he lavished on you. He says, you have made my heart beat faster. My sister, my bride, you have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. And continue with me. Verses 10 through 16. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue and the fragrance of your garment is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes along with all the finest spices. You are a garden spring, a well of fresh water and streams flowing from Lebanon. And through the rest of the chapter, chapter four, we see the beautiful bliss of the marriage and the intimate relationship of the marriage of Christ to his bride. We see the delight he takes in her as he presents her to himself. We see the delight that she brings to him. And again, we see the garden being brought up. And here, the garden, this garden is the place where they come to meet together, where they delight in one another. We hear the bride speak of preparing a garden for her beloved early in the morning, early in the song. And we finally see them coming to that garden in their marriage. And it's been prepared and offered by the bride, but it belongs entirely to the king. This is the place where they go in being alone with one another. Now in chapter five, we get into chapter five, we'll see some time has passed. And the king, he goes away, perhaps he goes to work, perhaps he goes to fulfill his duties. He goes away for a time and then he returns to come near and to be with her. To be near his bride again. And here in this chapter, we come to a point in the song which I call the turn. Starting in chapter 5, verse 2 through 6. This is the bride speaking. She says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night. I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? My beloved extended his hand through the opening. My feelings were aroused for him. I arose to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and he had gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. Observe the bride in this passage. This is the one who was so passionately in love with the king. She did all she could just to catch a glimpse of him. She planned her day so she could be near him when he might pass by. Where do you pasture your flock? She asks him in chapter one. Look at, look at her before the marriage in chapter three. We read it earlier, but she says, on my bed, night after night, I sought him whom my soul loves. She wakes up in the night because she's not near him. She just wants to be by him. She wants to be close to him. She wakes herself up. She says, I saw him, but I did not find him. She says to herself, I must arise now and go about the city. Seek him whom my soul loves. This one, the bride who loves her king so deeply, who desires him so passionately in the rest of the, chat, in the, rest of the book, the rest of the song. She loves him so much she would wake up in the night searching for him until at last. When she found him, she says, when I found him whom my soul loves, I held on to him and would not let him go. And now, after a time, when her beloved comes to her door, knocking and saying, open to me, she answers, how can I? I've taken off my dress. I've washed for the night. How can I get up again? 
And when she finally comes to herself, she realizes what she's done. She opens to her beloved, and her beloved is gone. Friends, as we read of this tragedy, I want to ask you, do you still delight in your beloved? Or has your passion gone cold? Do you remember a time when you were so passionately in love with the Savior that you would stay up all night in prayer? Or that you would stay up all night reading the Word just to be alone with Him? You were so passionate, you were so full of love for Him that every moment you could get to be with Him, it was a joy that you treasured up. It was like a cup of cold water to a dry and thirsty soul. Do you remember a time like that? Did you used to pray and take joy just to be with Him? That he could draw you away into the garden of his word. And you knew that the time was just for you to. And what now? How many times in the last week have you been lying awake in bed ready for sleep? And you feel the pull, the draw to get up and just sneak away in the quiet of the night. Just to be with him. Just to, to be near him. To hear his voice. You hear him call out to you. Open to me my darling. My dove. My perfect one. And where you used to delight in the thrill of the call. Now you refuse. You say, not now, Lord, I'm tired. I've had a long day. I have work to do in the morning. Not now, maybe, maybe another time. I just can't right now. You say, I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? You say, I've washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? And you reject him. How many times has he come to you like that? And how long have you refused and rejected to come away with him? Unless it was on your own time. Do you understand the tragic betrayal and heartbreak of this? The king has come to his beloved, the one for whom his heart beats. He desires her. He longs for her. He misses her. He's been up all night coming to her. He says, he says my, my, my hair is, is wet with the dew of the night. And then finally, when he gets to her, he knocks on the door, and she won't open to him. She isn't gone. He hasn't missed her. She's refused does this grieve your soul, brothers and sisters? Does it, does it grieve you that you do this to your king? Then finally the time comes when the bride comes to her senses. And she goes to open to her beloved. Verse, verses 4 through 6, My beloved extended his hand through the opening, and my feelings were aroused for him. I arose to open my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh. Verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away, and he had gone. She finally comes to her senses. She realizes what she's done, and, and he's left, he's gone away. How familiar is this to you? The king calls you away with him. He calls you away night after night, and then the time comes after refusing and neglecting him for so long, you open the door and you say, ah, now is the time, Lord. Now is the time that I can come away with you in devotion like we used to. Now I am ready for you. And it's as if he's gone. It's as if he's left you. You pray to him, but it's like there's a steel wall over your head. You read the Bible, you read the word, and it's like there's cotton in your ears. And you've grown tired and you've grown stale. And you say, oh, I was just a bad night. I was just tired, that's all. We'll, we'll try again tomorrow. This morning, I'll hear from my beloved. And again, the same time, it's fruitlessness. Your devotions grow stale. How many times has that happened? You've opened the door to your beloved, but he's gone away. You don't see him. You can't hear him. It's as if you are alone. Brothers and sisters, if Christ were like you and I, you would be alone in truth. If Christ were no different than we are, then after rejecting him so long, he would be gone without a trace. But he's not like you. He's not like me. And praise God that he's different than us, and that he's patient and steadfast in his love. For when he leaves the bride, he leaves something behind for her to know that he's been there. Look at verse 5. I rose to, my, to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bowl. The myrrh on her hands, it's not her perfume. It's, like she, it's not like she, she woke up and got herself ready to see him. No, she woke up and immediately opened the door, and on the handle, he left this, this, this myrrh, this, like a perfume. It's like his calling card, this reminder of him, his scent, to say, I've been here, and I've missed you, but I was here, and to remind her of him. And as the king in the song leaves behind his scent, his, his calling card to show his love that he has been near and that she's missed him, so does Christ do the same thing with you and I. 
Perhaps many of you are in this kind of season now where like the bride in the song, you're going about the streets, you're looking for your beloved again and calling out to Christ and you can't find him. You can't, you don't know where he's at. He's not near. You don't hear his voice. You don't know where he's gone, but you know he's been near you and you desire him and you regret rejecting him. And it's like you're all the way back at square one and you're searching for him. You feel worn out. You feel tired and beaten broken down and you pray crying out that you may just be near him again where has he gone to how can i come back to my beloved but there is a scent there's an aroma left that he's there he's near but what can you do where has he gone so let's finish this part of the song starting in verse 6 verses 6 through 16 i open to my beloved but my beloved has turned away and gone My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. And then she speaks to the audience, to the chorus. She says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved as to what you will tell him, for I am lovesick. Let's pause there for just a moment. Let's get to verse 9. What kind of beloved is your beloved, O most beautiful among women? They respond. What kind of beloved is your beloved that thus you adjure us? And I do want to pause there. So this is just kind of my own inflection here, but you can take it with what you will. But as you're reading through this, you see the narrative of how the bride loves her beloved and and finally comes to a point where she rejects him. He comes to her. and, And you remember all the maidens, they desire him as well. But he chose her. And then finally she rejects him. She goes in the street looking for him and she's, she's beaten by the watchman and the guards. She's, she's abused by his watchman and his guards. She finally comes to the daughters of Jerusalem saying, help me find him. And they answer her, what kind of beloved is your beloved? And it, it's almost, you can almost imagine, you can almost hear this sense in the chorus of the, the chorus mocking her, saying, how great can he actually be? If he's your beloved, he chose you and you didn't even open your door to him. Why should we help you when you couldn't even be bothered to let him in? And then let's see her reply. Let's see her reply to them. What kind of beloved is your beloved that thus you adjure us? She is beside herself with love. Verses 10 through 16. My beloved is dazzling and ruddy. He's outstanding among 10,000. His head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like the clusters of dates as black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. His cheeks are like a bed of balsam, banks of sweet scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is full of sweetness and he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved. And this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Chapter 6, verse 1. After her emphatic praise of him, she speaks of what love they have together, how how beautiful he is in ways that don't even make sense. How can he have red hair and black hair and gold hair? That's just how beautiful he is to her. He is everything. How do the daughters reply? If they were mocking her before, they're not now. Chapter 6, verse 1. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? We see the daughters of Jerusalem respond. And after the bride describes her love in this emphatic way, it's like their hearts are set on edge. Like they just, they need to see this glorious one that he described, that she describes to them and see him united with the woman that loves him this much. They pause and ask, how great is your love for your king? How many of you would sway the masses to just gaze upon the one you love because of how you pray? I'm not talking about some stupid form of evangelism that doesn't work to say just live like you love Jesus and don't ever lose worship. That works maybe like a tenth of the time, a tenth of a percent of the time. If you love him so much that even the world who hates him wants to see how you love him, do you praise him like that? That they're set on edge. Perhaps they might mock you, think you're a fool set on edge to see how could one be so good to God. Verses 2 through 3. My beloved has gone down to his garden. So let's go back real quick. This is important. I asked the question before. In your devotions, 
when it feels like he's gone, when it feels like he's left you, you don't know where he's gone, but he's left you a scent, he's left you a calling card. You know that he's near. And you're crying out, you're praying, where have you gone, Lord? Where can I be with you? Come be with me again. Just like the bride, she searches through the cities and she can't find him. Then finally, after she praises him, she worships him, and she tells them of how lovely he is, she's reminded. They ask her in verse 1, where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? And she remembers. In chapter, in chapter 6, verse 2, she remembers, my beloved has gone down to his garden to the beds of balsam, to, the, to pasture his flock in the gardens and gather lilies. Verse three, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine, he who pastures his flock among the lilies. After she's gone off beside herself and she's gone out and she describes him, she adores him, she praises him, asking the, 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 the daughters of Jerusalem, ask her, where has your love gone to? She remembers he's returned to the garden. He hasn't left. He hasn't left her. He hasn't left you. He has gone to where he always goes, to where you always go. He's gone to that place that they always go to sneak away alone. He's gone to his garden, prepared by the bride as a gift, an offering of her love. That place of solitude for them to be alone is his to enter as he pleases. And that is where he waits for her. And what is it she should find when she returns to him? What do you think? you would find after returning to him. If he was like you and me and he's there, what, he's going to be sitting on, he's going to be sitting on a bench. He's going to be grumbling to himself, moaning. He's going to, he's going to show you. Yeah. Verses four through 12. What does she find? She comes to the garden. He says, you are as beautiful as the herds of my garden, as lovely as Jerusalem, as awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me for they confuse me. Your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Gilead. He still loves her. He still desires her. He's not turned away from her. She doesn't have to prove herself. Verse, verse 7, your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. There are 60 queens and airy concubines and maidens without number. But my dove, my perfect one, is unique. She's her mother's only daughter. She is the pure child of the one who bore her. The maiden saw her and called her blessed the queens and the concubines also, and they praised her saying, who is this that grows like the dawn, as beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun, as awesome as an army with banners? Verse 11, I went down to the orchard of nut trees to see the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded or the pomegranates had bloomed. Before I was aware, my soul set me over the chariots of my noble people. Does she come upon the king off in the garden soul? No. Does she come to find him pacing, angry, saying, I'll show her a thing or two, rejecting me when I come to her. I'll teach her to do that again. Doesn't she know I'm the king? Who does she think she is? No. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't forsake his beloved. He isn't angry with her. He doesn't tell her, you need to prove yourself to me or I'm going to send you away. He left and he went to wait and to work in that special place of theirs until she came to him again. Now, there's something here, husbands, on how you ought to treat your wife. That is not my point today. Look at how Christ treats his bride. He does not forsake her. He is not angry with her. Not in this sense. You can picture it. It's almost like he went to the garden and he, he perhaps he picks a bouquet of flowers together. He gathers it together just waiting for her to arrive. He gathers fruit together. It's like he's preparing, storing up more and more love to lavish on her from finally when they meet again in the garden because he knows that she will come to him. And there he waits to delight in her again. Is this surprising to you? Is she not his prize? Friends, this is the picture of your king. Do you think in this season that he has left you? Does it feel as though your beloved has rejected you? I tell you the truth, he's not far off. You know where he's gone. He's in the garden. He waits for you, not with a stern word, not with a rod for penance. He waits to be alone with you. He waits for you to stay a while, to stay a while with the one whom he shed his blood for. The one whom he shed his blood to win. Is the church not his pride? Do you not think he knows what sorry and fickle creatures you are? Yet what has he said? My dove, my perfect one is unique. She is her mother's only. You are altogether beautiful to him, remember. 
Do not stay away. Don't stay away flailing yourself for penance, thinking, oh, I have sinned against him. I've rejected him too long. He doesn't want me. And thinking this, you're right. You have sinned against him. Thinking that he's like you. He is not like you. He's not like you, brothers and sisters. He is so much greater than you. So much greater than an angel is of the tiniest ant. That is how much greater he is than you. And more so. Unless you think because of his excellence, you're unworthy to him. Well, friend, I tell you, you are unworthy of him. But has he not made you worthy? And shall not the lamb receive the reward for his suffering? His bride is the reward for his suffering. You, saint, as a member of her, as a part of the bride, are his prize. And as such to him, you are altogether beautiful. You are altogether darling to him. Do not stay away from him. Run to him in the garden. Run to him on your knees and plead with him again to raise you up and to take you by the hand away to the secret place. His desire is for you, Christian, to sanctify you and to present you to himself gloriously cleansed by his own blood. And what great love there is in the Lord. I want to look at one more passage before we close. And in doing this, I want to show this great exclusive love of the church in Christ. This is exclusive. No one else takes part of it. It is for him and his bride alone. And you as members of the bride partake of it. But for those who are outside, it is not for them. Verse 13, remember the audience is with her. The the daughters of Jerusalem, they're looking for the king with her. And when they're united, he takes her away with him. Verse 13, they say, come back, come back, O Shulamite. Come back that we may gaze at you. As the king responds, he says, why should you gaze at the Shulamite? As at the dance of two companies. Here we see the daughters of Jerusalem, who the bride adjured to help her, asked, begged to help her find the one she loves, who perhaps, if I'm correct, scoffed at her request and then quickly shifted and changed their mind after hearing the bride's discussion of her love. But look at how close they are to the woman and her beloved. They are perhaps not in the garden, but they see her. And they see her being taken away and embraced by her love. Look at their proximity. They're near, but they're outside. When the king embraces her, it's as if he's taking her away again to, to a quiet and lonely place that no one else can see, that they may be alone together in unity and communion. And these outsiders, they're able to witness the great love of the two when they come together and the beauty of the bride. But that's all they can do. They bear witness, and that's it. They could only bear witness, and when the king takes his bride away, they cry for her to come back to them, the one, perhaps, who they mock. They want to see her again. They long to continue watching. But friends, there is a time when they can no longer even do that. They can't even witness the love of her. They will not even have the right to witness the great love of Christ and his bride from the outside, and so it is with the world outside of At the best of times, the world outside of Christ can witness this great love, see it from afar. But there is a day set when even that honor will be taken away. And how does the king answer the chorus when they try to tempt the bride away from him? Come, come back, Shulamite. How does he answer? He says, why should you even gaze at the Shulamite? Well, what right do you have to even look at my love? Like some performance, let alone speak to the prize of my heart. She is not for you. To get entertainment from. She is not for you to look at and desire. You do not get to speak to her and call her away from me. And so it is with Christ and his beloved. And all these who would seek to call her away from his love, he will not allow it. And a fierce protector is the Lord of glory. Praise his holy name that he is a fierce protector of his bride. And finally, in closing here, this is my final blessing to you all. This is, this is why I gathered this sermon together. Perhaps it was Cam's planning because he's been trying to get me to preach Song of Solomon for a year that it happened to fall on Valentine's Day, but that was not my plan. Perhaps it's just divine providence. But this was my this was my hope in preaching this sermon. After last week's great sermon, of calling all of us to account and to examine ourselves, we need that. My goal is not to undercut that, but to know that the heart is deceitful and that even in a godly exhortation. The enemy will try to get a foothold to cause you to sin. Even in your repentance, he'll try to get you to sin, to doubt that Christ still loves you. 
And so in closing here, my final blessing is with these words to all who heard this. <clears throat> may the words of this sermon, and more importantly, may the words of the Lord in the Song of Solomon, rightly divided, be a soothing balm to the pain conscience of the one who, after examining his soul, found that he is black and swarthy by the stains of sin. May it comfort the one whose heart cries out, do not look at me, because he's been scorched with the oppressive heat of the curse of rebellion. May it encourage and edify you who have examined yourself with tears and repentance and long for the embrace of your beloved. And also, may these words likewise provoke jealousy leading to repentance in that bold, that fool Pharisee who seeing the repentance and lamentation of his brother says, I thank God that you did not make me like this one. If you will not humbly examine yourself and repent, then may you who think you delight the eye of the groom by your arrogant self-assurance see the bride with her love from the outside and cry, come back, only to be answered by the great one, why should you gaze at my beloved like the dance of two companies? And may God bless you. who Let's close in a word of Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I pray that this was honoring to you. I pray that you're glorified in these words. May everything I said burn up if it is not your word. May your bride be edified and encouraged by your love, and may she be provoked to seek your love more and more daily to wake up in the night and come away with you, to not be burdened by your call to love, but to delight in it again. Please, Lord, take me into your garden once again. Draw me up by the hand and lead me away that I can be alone with you and know the intimacy of your love. 